All right, commissioners, let's go to item 6B, update on outreach and land management plan for the Lower Onion Creek area. Ms. Gibson's here today to address us. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Leah Gibson, and I'm a land manager for Watershed Protection. I'm in the Field Operations Division um, in the Green Infrastructure Management Program. So we manage ponds, creeks, and open spaces that Watershed owns and maintains. And that includes about 700 acres of land citywide. We, uh, some land we own because it has a stormwater infrastructure pur purpose, like, like a pond or a channel. And then a large portion of that is buyout properties as well. So I'm excited to talk to you about our largest buyout property the Onion, in the Onion Creek, the lower Onion Creek area. So a quick history of this project. Um, this is the corner of William Cannon and Pleasant Valley. There were 813 houses total removed from the 25 and 100 year floodplains in this area. Over half of those were done with matching funds from the US Army Corps of Engineer Partnership. Um, those wrapped up in 2017. And then there are 340 that were 100% funded by Watershed. Uh, those wrapped up just last year, and there's about 10 homes left in the area that refused the buyout offer. So our Army Corps partnership included an agreement that um, the, the 25 year area that you see, in this map it says the Yerby Bend Recreation Area, Hard has since, uh, I think, decided to call it the Onion Creek Metro Park at Yerby Bend, so the name needs to be updated a little bit. Um, but so the, the agreement for this project was that the Army Corps would um, help with the buyouts, remove some of the streets, and convert some of those to trails. There's both concrete and gravel trails. They added a parking area and a restroom to complement the existing restroom. Uh, over by the dog park area. And um, they designated over 200 acres of ecosystem restoration areas. They've done, I think they've completed a, a, most of that already with tree plantings and they plan to come back again this upcoming winter and early spring 2020 to finish that. There's a low water crossing trail, 31 pavilions, and um, there was a ribbon cutting to kind of open the area uh, on June 22nd. And so moving forward, this area will be managed by Parks and Recreation, it's dedicated parkland, and Watershed will maintain management um, on the areas that you see outlined in yellow, which also needs to be updated slightly. <laughs> so these are the streets that were removed in the Army Corps area. And I kind of love before and after photos, so I included some here just to give you an idea of what that looks like from a publicly accessible street to a concrete trail. And then in some of the areas where there's gravel trails, um, that's kind of what that looks like now. So a little bit about um, how Watershed manages our open space in general. Once we acquire a new property, it's added to our mowing contract, and most of those properties are mowed four to six times per year, depending on where the site is and the site characteristics. After about a year, or as the project wraps up, we start engaging the community by attending meetings and talking about potential avenues to move forward with the property and, and what to kind of get an idea of what the neighbors want to see. Do they just want us to keep it mowed, or do they want to get involved and kind of take ownership of that space? So some potential uses that we've had at some of our properties, uh, we can plant wildflower seed and reduce the amount of mowing and call it a meadow. We can not mow at all and establish a grow zone in the area if it's on a creek or some other type of wildlife habitat. Orchards and community gardens are really popular. Um, we can work with the neighborhood association or other neighborhood group to formally adopt the property 
and support them through some native landscaping or trails, some, some sort of um, a maintenance agreement moving forward. Um, we can also do invasive removal with our partnership with Keep Austin Beautiful. We can do tree plantings and other things, other ideas people have had involved like public art or green classrooms, things like that. Buyouts are really interesting and they come with their own set of challenges and opportunities. One really cool thing, uh, in my opinion, is that as the homes, as people move away, the, the fruit trees, the landscaping trees, those are all left behind. And so as you drive through the area, you'll see lots of figs and loquats and, um, you know, a random agave. <laughs> the, but with that comes the fact that people have planted bamboo and ligustrum in the past. And so that stuff kind of gets let loose. Um, I have a picture of palm trees. They're not particularly terrible, but they're just, you know, a different challenge. <laughs> There's also a... Um, an emotional tie that people have with these spaces that we need to incorporate as we move forward with management. Um, it, it, you can see this tree here has Christmas lights in it and another tree has a tree house. Um, you know, people lived in these spaces and called them their homes. And, and to some people, um, they, they're always gonna have that tie with that space. At one of our other properties, there, uh, there's a community garden now and the neighbors have gotten together and really like reclaimed ownership of this space. And they talk about a lot how it used to be an emotional scar when they walked by the property because they would think about the trauma from going through an event like a flood and they would think about their neighbors, but as they come together and regain ownership of this space, it's just become a really healing event. And so that's something that is really important for us to to keep in mind as we work with the communities on repurposing these spaces. Um, another challenge is the soil. A, a lot of times people get really excited about a community garden um, or the idea of one, and they want, they're really eager to get started. But most of the site uh, has been under a concrete foundation for decades. And then we go in and demo it and compact it um, and so it's not always like ready to break ground. So that's a challenge. And then a, a, another tacked on challenge to having the site undergo so many changes is tree management. Um, as I said, people plant stuff, um, they maintain it while they're there. And then when they move away, it doesn't get watered, it doesn't get pruned. And these aren't always trees that are native to the area that we would plant if we were, you know, having our own natural area that we're building. So we do spend a significant chunk of our tree contract on cleaning up these spaces after a storm when some of these trees decide that uh, they're gonna give up. Bait and Loop um, is at Stastny and Westgate and I included it in this presentation because it's kind of like our shining star of buyout properties because it's uh, the neighborhood, it's one of those examples where the neighborhood really came together and took ownership of this space and made it their own. There were 25 homes removed back in 2011 after frequent flooding, and they've done just about everything you can do with the space to, to call it their own. They've built a community garden, they've planted lots of fruit trees, they have benches um, that, that are flood proof, they've done a lot of sapling planting, They've removed a significant amount of ligustrum with help from our staff. They've done their own seeding, and we've done some seeding to supplement that. And we've worked with them on a vegetation management plan to, uh, to acknowledge the areas that they're wanting to restore, but keep some of the other areas mowed more frequently so that they can have a little sitting area uh, without tall grass. Here's a before and after of their community garden. And here's just some other ways that they use the space. They have a 4th of July parade. Um, they use it for other holiday events. They have garden to table dinners. So it's, it's a really beautiful community effort. 
So getting back to Onion Creek, some of the questions before moving forward that I wanted to answer were what can we offer with our limited resources to supplement the existing services and amenities in the area that PARD would be providing through the uh, Onion Creek Metro Park? How can we create partnerships to help us repurpose this area to best serve the community, but also be compatible for floodplain use? And how can we leverage these new partnerships to help us reach a diverse population and keep them engaged throughout this process? So the first thing I did was reach out for partnerships. Um, GAVA has a mission that really closely aligns with, with I think, how the space could be used. So um, I approached them. SFC, I work with SFC on a number of our other properties. The Onion Creek Park Neighborhood Association, Austin Parks Foundation, and then um, internally with watershed staff and other departments. So we started to engage the community by collaborating with other city staff. We designed um, a survey um, and laid it out. We had paper copies. It was available on SurveyMonkey. We did door hangers and we did flyers. This was in the pink areas here are door hanger areas uh, where we placed door hangers in the community. We also had targeted social media posts through Facebook and Nextdoor. We uh, partnered with Prez Elementary and got the word out to their staff and the parents of their students. We went to neighborhood meetings. We used our partner, new partnership to um, get the word out through their distribution list. And then we flyered some locations uh, like community centers such as libraries and rec centers. It was open for uh, most of the month of November. And we got 250 total responses, which was really encouraging. Uh, 50 of those lived either within the buyout areas, either they refused the offer, or they lived within two blocks of the buyout area. And I wanted to get an idea of those living in it or near it. Um, so I wanted to get an idea of what their opinions were so that I could compare how they felt about this space compared to people that lived further away and maybe just visited once per week. Three of those were in Spanish. Three people took advantage of the paper copies at the library. And then 86 people chimed in uh, with additional comments, which is really cool because I always love to hear what people have to say. So you have a copy in your packet of the actual, the numbers if you like really want to dive into those survey results. You're more than welcome to. I'm just going to like do a quick summary of what people were really supportive of and what concerns people had and how, we're how I'm going to use those as we move forward to implement a long-term land management plan. And this is a word cloud of all of the 86 comments. So there was an overwhelming support of uh, reducing the amount of mowing in the area, removing more streets, or at a minimum just closing them to traffic, removing street lights in areas that aren't being used, uh, planting more pollinator habitat, planting more trees, community agriculture, planting fruit trees, walking paths, and just in general using the area to benefit the Onion Creek ecosystem. There were four main areas of concerns that people had. Um, one of those was security after dark, and that kind of dives into the next one, which is the homeless population. Then there was a concern about illegal dumping. Um, ongoing in, in, in the past, and then fallen trees and the, the perceived lack of mowing in some of these areas where we're doing some habitat restoration. So those were the, uh, those, those four areas of concern was what I wanted to dive into first because I wanted people to really know that we're hearing them and that we're doing something about it. Um, so developing a relationship with the APD representative in that area has been uh, critical in my success in this. Um, we know, we check in with each other, we know who each other are and, and what our roles are, and we check in with, with each other frequently anytime there's a problem. The next is working with legal to establish a curfew via administrative rules. And so this is important because PARD has administrative rules that govern their properties. Watershed, and that's, that's where you'll find a curfew, and that's what allows APD to enforce a curfew after hours. Watershed, being that we weren't immediately in a land management role when our, when our department was, uh, when, at the beginning of our department, 
we uh, never established any administrative rules that had a curfew involved. Like I said earlier, a lot of our properties are stormwater infrastructure, so we post a no trespassing sign because it's actually dangerous for people to be hanging out in there. But now that we have a lot of open space properties where we want people to use them just during designated hours, we're finding the need that we, we're finding a need to adopt, to draft and adopt an, a set of administrative rules to govern our properties. And so we have a draft of those right now that we're working on with legal. I expect we'll go back and forth a little bit about that. It will have to be posted for 30 days for public comment before being adopted. Um, also have been working on a potential partnership with Pard Rangers, not necessarily to have a security type role, but just to help develop a positive relationship with the community and how they interact with that space. And then signage, lots of signage. The response to illegal dumping is going to come from a lot of street closures. There's a lot of areas that really just don't need to be opened anymore, and so we're exploring the use of closing them off with a gate, with a combo lock, kind of like what you see here. This is at bait and loop. And then also a combination of that and using boulders in some of the grassier areas. And then also coordinating with Austin Resource Recovery for regular sweeps of the area. The perceived lack of mowing and fallen trees, um, a lot of that is education communication and perception and managing expectations of the community. Uh, managing or planting native grass and wildflower seed d needs to have some kind of expectation uh, communicated along with it so that people know it's not an instant um, blue bonnet field. And so we're, one thing we do to kind of help keep these areas neat and tidy and, and look purposeful is to mow a buffer around them. So we'll mow six to 10 feet back from the curb, and that helps people understand, like, this is done on purpose. This wasn't an area that the city just forgot about. So we'll continue to, to plant some of these areas with um, seed annually and keep mowing a buffer. We'll use signs to designate these areas as wildflower meadows. And then there's also some grow zones in the area that we'll add signage to as well. And we can use some of our contracts to address some of the weedier species that tend to um, upset people a little bit more, such as the Johnson grass or the bastard cabbage. Um, some of those things get tall really quickly and people immediately want it mowed. And then after the spring and fall storms, we'll do a biannual sweep with our chipper uh, that Field Ops has, and then we'll be able to use our tree contract in the interim to address any other hazardous tree conditions. So ongoing things we're doing now and things that we will continue to do. Um, like I said, we, we have planted some areas with native grass and wildflower seed. We'll, we're going to continue to do that and continue to put up signage. We did some initial soil testing. We took hundreds of samples to make sure that there was not any ongoing concern about um, soil contamination. The, first, the last thing we want to do is invite people uh, to garden on our on our property and then discover that there's a problem. So we've been working with GAVA to, uh, GAVA has led some, some initial discussions with the neighbors and the elementary school um, and other city departments about where we could have some type of community agriculture or orchard and what that would look like and to what extent each stakeholder wants to be involved. And going to a lot of community community meetings, um, so we've, I've taken the feedback from the survey and we've gone, we've created vision maps and we've gone to any meeting that we get invited to or that we hear about and present this information and ask people for feedback. And, um, you know, we know that this is an ongoing conversation and that we will need to tweak our plan as we move forward and, and start implementing this. So here's a overall vision map. One big thing I took away from most of these meetings that I went to is that people don't care if it's part, what part's pards and what part is watersheds. They just want, they look at the area as one unit. And so it should be managed as such. So I've been working pretty closely with PARD to, to create a cohesive management plan that, um, that goes together and is not fragmented. And we'll start making this available on the website along with the survey results 
and our next step is to really get out there and, and put up some signs. Any questions? No question. Uh, Commissioner Thompson. Uh, well, thanks, Leah, for meeting with uh, my husband and I about the administrative rules. So I'm wondering, are those going to be presented to us at the Environmental Council for review or... They certainly can be. I, at this point, I'm not sure what the normal like steps to take would be as after we you know have our final draft that we come up with, but we can certainly come back and update you all on that and release it for some feedback if we want to do that before we actually post it for public comment. I'd really appreciate that because um, when we have natural areas, well, as we discussed, when we have natural areas, um, they if people are doing damage there, then there needs to be some sort of recourse. So I think it's really important that it's established in the administrative rules what the process would be for that yes, and maybe. how all the different agencies that would help us in the parks from the rangers to whatever would uh, react when there is a, a complaint made. So thanks a lot for that. Absolutely, we hope to spell all that out in the rules. That'd be good. So you can come back to us before. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. I would like that. All would right. That, would that be good? That'd be fine. Oh, good. Yes. Um, I just want to say it's a really great area. I, I live not too far from it. Cool. And, <laughs> and uh, I have friends that come. I know a lot of friends come across from across to Austin because they like the off-leash dog park area. But um, to have an area that, you know, has the floods and the tragedy kind of behind those events and to turn it into a way to save public space for the people to live in the area. It's um, an incredible project and it's come a long way and um, I'm excited to watch the future of it. Cool, me too. And I've got to give a lot of, lot of credit to everyone that's, that's really worked together to make it happen. The Army Corps, PARD, and Watershed, um, you know, it's, it's been an, a team effort, absolutely. Thank you, B. Smith. Um, one question I have is, I know that it looks like there's a long-term, long-range planning here, and there doesn't seem to be an issue with funding for this as it continues. Can you tell me where this all this funding is coming from right now? Just to clarify, do you mean the funding for um, actual buying out the homes? No, the signage and the, the different uh, buffering and mowing. Is it a collaborative er effort being done between department budgets or? Uh, parts kind of handling their um, end of things. We are um, actually able to save money by seeding some of these areas and reducing the mowing that our contractor is taking on. So uh, I don't have the numbers for this specific area, but uh, it comes from our green infrastructure management fund. And um, so we, we seed and we have, we'll be seeding with our internal crews. So we won't be relying on a contractor for seeding either. But for the tree removals and the signage and those other items, those are going to be... We have a, a, a tree contract that we use for the, for the tree removal or, or tree maintenance. Um, we don't really, we don't proactively remove trees. I mean, we, when a tree falls, if it's, not, um, if it's not a nuisance, if it's not blocking traffic, if it's not threatening life or property, we generally want to leave it there and let it decompose and contribute to the ecosystem. Um, so we're not, we don't spend a lot of effort proactively removing trees. It's more um, trees that might fall where someone's walking in, in areas that are frequented by park users or walkers or uh, neighbors. And that all comes from our tree contract. But the signage and where's the signage gonna come from? The signage is also the Green Infrastructure okay. Management Fund. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that information. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.